Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem sum of all subset XOR totals. So this is an easy problem, but there is a solution to this problem that is pretty damn hard, I would say. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you one, the probably intended solution that makes this an easy problem. It's not going to be like the most efficient. It's going to be exponential. And I'm also going to show you an optimal solution, which I will warn you is pretty mathematical. And I'll even admit to you that I actually wasn't able to come up with it by myself. I didn't know that an efficient solution actually existed for this problem until I skimmed the editorial. But I recognize that that editorial is pretty uh, difficult to read. So if I can make it any easier for you to understand, I'm happy to do so. But let's get started with this problem. Kind of like yesterday's problem, it's all about the XOR binary operation. Basically, we're given an array of elements. I'll take the second example. It's a bit more interesting. 5, 1, 6. We want every single subset of these elements. Now, remember, subset is not the same as a subarray. If we were only talking about subarrays, then we'd have roughly n squared subarrays. But with subsets, the idea is different. We'll have about 2 to the power of n. And the reason for that is with a subset, we have a choice for every single element. We can either choose to include it or not include it. So if I just wanted to show you what every single subset from this looked like, I would do this. I'd say, okay, first time we include five and we can also skip five and then we can include one and then we can skip one. We can include six, we can skip six over here and we can include six here and of course skip it. Same thing over here. I'll just quickly draw it out here. We're at the second choice. We can either include one, skip one. Here we can either include six, skip six and same exact decision down here. Now, if you take any one of these root to leaf paths, you will have a different subset. Even though the input elements could be duplicates, so like even though like two sets might have the exact same values, there are still technically different subsets. So if you count all of these, you're going to see we have, I think, eight, right? So the reason for that is we branch by two every single time. If you look at the height of this decision tree that I have, it's a height of three. Therefore, we're going to get two to the power of three. That's going to be eight. There's eight different subsets that we can form. And if you look at one of them, it's an interesting one over here where we literally didn't include any element. So that actually does technically count as a subset. So that subset in the context of this problem, which I guess I should talk about for every single one of these subsets, we want to take all the elements and XOR them together. And then we'll get a result. So if we were to XOR, I think these three together, we'd get something like this. Well, actually, let me uh, start with the other one. If we were to XOR nothing together, like there's no elements to begin with, then obviously that's gonna be zero. This one over here, where we have nothing but a single six, a six by itself is just gonna be six, right? This one over here, six and one, if we were to XOR six and one together, what would we get? Well, in the binary representation, one looks like this, six, I think looks like this. So if we XOR them together, I think we actually get seven. So for each of those, we're going to end up adding all of them up. And that's the result that we're trying to return. So for any given subset, XOR all the values, and then for that, get that total and then add all those totals up. So we'll have eight numbers. One of them is definitely going to be zero. And then we'll add all of them up. And that's what we're trying to return. So obviously, the brute force solution of this is recursive. And time complexity is going to be 2 to the power of n. To implement it in terms of code, obviously, we have to keep track of which position we're at in the input array. I'll use a parameter i for that. In terms of implementation, there are different ways that you can do it. But I think the easiest way definitely is to just keep track of the total. The total of like the XOR values as we go. So like by the time we're here, the total is obviously five. When we're here, we have nothing. The total is initially zero. When we're here, we are going to take the original total five and XOR it with one. And then we'll have a new total and then we'll kind of keep track of that total. And then by the time here we get to the base case, we'll know we're at the base case because we're at the end of the array. And then we can just return that total. And obviously we're going to have two recursive calls. 
because we're branching in two different directions. So I'm gonna go ahead and code this one up first. So I like to have a little recursive function. I'm gonna call it DFS. And like I said, we're gonna have two parameters, I and just keeping track of the total. As you can imagine, the way we're gonna call this DFS is starting at index zero and having our total initially be zero. And then we're gonna return the result of this. And we expect this to compute the total. So here, what I'm gonna do is say, first of all, the base case you can imagine is gonna be what I said. If I is the end, then let's just go ahead and return the total. Otherwise, we have two choices. I wanna be very explicit with what we're doing here. We have one choice, include nums of i. In other words, we are going to make a recursive call. We're gonna say DFS, go to index i plus one. That's simple enough. Like we're gonna do that regardless, but what's the total gonna be? If we include this number, our new total is gonna be total XORD with the number uh, nums of i. That's simple enough, but be very clear with what this function is actually doing. What this function is doing is it's returning the total of all subsets, including this number, every single subset, because recursively, we're going to make that decision that I'm about to show you. We have the decision to include this number. We have the decision to not include nums of i. And that would look pretty similar. Let's go ahead and fix this. It'd be very similar. I'm sure you can modify it. It's just gonna be removing this part of the code. So this is gonna be returning the sum of all subsets that do include this number. This is gonna be returning the sum of all subsets that don't include that number. And what we want to do is just total these two up and then return the result. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm just gonna, I guess, get rid of the comments now and just add these up in the same line because you probably can see what each of these means. Let's go ahead and run this. As you can see on the left, it works and supposedly it's pretty efficient, but there is a much more efficient solution to this problem that I'm about to show you right now. So I would buckle up because this is gonna be a fun one, at least for me, because you guys know how much I love math and I know how much you guys don't like math, at least most of you. So this is mainly, I just wanna say combinatorics. It's kind of a branch of like discrete maths. It's like related to statistics and stuff like that. And it's also somewhat related to binary obviously. The idea here is obviously we know for each of these numbers, like we're going to have two to the power of three subsets. So let's just continue with this example because it's small. So I'm just going to kind of draw like four little boxes here. These are going to be each of the subsets. We know that we can either include this or not include it. So half the subsets are going to include five. Let's say that this row includes five and then this row does not include five. So I'll just put a little red X here. You can suppose like one is included in half of them somewhere. They're just not like going to be nicely organized as these. So these have five included. These ones do not. Okay. I've also uh, just gone ahead and shown you the binary representation of each of these. That's going to make our lives a little bit more easy. So suppose we just take five by itself because we know five by itself is technically a subset as well. Let's take a look at it. There's a zero here. There's a one here. There's a zero here. And there's a one here. Now, there's going to be a bunch of leading zeros here. None of those are ever going to change, right? Because with XOR, we're never going to be adding a one somewhere where it doesn't exist. So now we're trying to look at an individual subset and we're trying to really understand what an individual subset could possibly look like. We know for sure none of the subsets are going to have a one bit over here. I mean, we know that with 100% certainty, don't we? I think it's obvious why, because for us to have one as the result of an XOR operation, there has to be a one in the first place, right? And consider the other positions, like the other columns here. If there's a one in any of these rows, there's 100% gonna be at least one subset where a one shows up. Because remember, we can take an individual element and just consider it as a subset. So even if we had three ones here, we'd have a subset. Even if I got rid of this element and there's two ones here, even though one XORed with one ends up as zero, well, we can still at least take this as an individual subset and this as an individual subset. So 
Now I'm going to start looking at each of these positions, each of these four positions. And I've gone ahead and just moved that over there. Now I want to ask among our two to the power of three subsets, how many of them are going to have a one bit set over here? Obviously zero for reasons we just discussed. Now I'm actually going to go to this column because this one is a simple case. Two to the power of three. How many of these eight subsets are going to have a one bit over here? You try to answer that question. Seriously, just look at this column. There's two zeros and there's a one here. Uh, this number is six. We know six is going to be included in half the subsets and half the subsets are not going to include six. If six is included in a subset, regardless of which of the other elements are included, isn't it true that this one bit is always going to be set because one XORed with zero is always going to be one. You can do it a hundred times. It's still going to be one. So what I'm getting at is when there's only a single bit set in like a column, then half of the subsets, in other words, two to the power of three minus one, half of the subsets are going to have this bit set. Okay, now is the part where it's going to get really interesting, and that is this. Suppose I have half the subsets where they look like this, where this bit is set, and I have half the subsets where this bit is not set. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, this bit. So let's just draw a zero and a one. Half of them are zero, half of them are one. Now suppose I introduced here a new value. I introduce very intentionally this value zero zero and a zero over here. But here I'm putting a one. Suppose I did that. So obviously we have taken our subsets and doubled them, right? We've multiplied it by two because now this subset is going to be included in half and not included in half of them. OK, so we know originally our ratio of zero to ones in this bit was 50 50, right? So now I'm going to take this new value and I'm going to XOR it with everything we have. If I take this one and I XOR it with a zero because half remember half those subsets are going to have a zero here. If I XOR one with zero, what do I get? I flip it, of course, right? I flip it and it turns into a one. Now I take this and I XOR it with the other half of those subsets that we had. So obviously in this particular position, it's going to be one XOR with one. What does that result in? It results in a zero. It gets flipped. So the ratio what I'm getting at is going to stay 50 50 because half of them had a zero in this spot. If I XOR one with zero, it turns into one and half of them had a one in this spot. If I XOR one with one, I get zero. So it looks to me like if we have two ones in a particular column, we still have half the subsets where this bit is going to be set and half the subsets where they're not going to be set. And obviously, if I introduce another one, if I had three ones here, then I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to set all of them that have a zero to be a one and all of them that have a one to be a zero. So in other words, if there is a bit set in any column, half of the total set of subsets is going to include a one. Now I'm going to get very, very concrete and go through this example by hand. And there won't be a single doubt in your mind why the solution I'm about to show you is going to work. So what we've learned is that this column, of course, half of the subsets are going to be a one. And obviously we know that since there's a one set somewhere in this column, half of the subsets are going to be one here as well. Two to the power of three minus one. Same thing over here. So if half of the subsets have a one in this spot, then isn't it fair to say that this value is going to be multiplied by the value below it? Like this here alone, like this by itself, just kind of ignoring these two for a second, this by itself is the value four. like that's what this bit represents. And it shows up two to the power of three minus one times. In other words, it shows up to the power of two, which is four. It shows up four times. This bit is going to show up four times among these eight subsets. So we can say this, which is the number four multiplied by four. What about this? Well, it represents the number two. That bit is going to show up four times. So we take two times four. 
And same thing over here. This represents one. It shows up four times. Four different subsets are going to include that value. So we're going to say one times four. So now we can just total these up. We're not obviously looking at each individual subset and looking at what that number represents. We're just saying that this bit is going to show up, you know, however many times and we're adding it up that many times. So if we were to total each of these up, it's going to be 16, 8, and four, if you add all those up, I think you get something like 24. But obviously you can see that here, a good way to simplify this would actually be to take the number itself. Like we have four, two, and one. Why not just take that number, the sum of that seven, which is what like this represents, and multiply that by two to the power of three minus one, which is of course four, which is of course 28. Now, if this doesn't make sense, let me just quickly draw eight random subsets that don't necessarily match the result of this, but they're consistent with what I said down here. So what I'm saying is that there's gonna be eight rows and half of them are gonna have this one bit set. So let's just assume it looks like this. So I'm gonna put it like that. I'm also gonna say that half of them are gonna have this bit set. It could be overlapping with this or not. So let's say zero, one, zero, one, zero, one one zero one and i guess since we put all zeros here we have to put these ones up here so let's just put uh those four ones here and then zeros here so this is consistent with the logic over here even though these are definitely not the eight subsets that are going to be generated by this but the sum of these is still going to be 28 because to total these eight subsets up is literally just taking this, which is two times four, taking this, which is four times four, taking this, which is four times one. Okay, now let's finally get into the solution. How does all of this help us? Well, all we have to do is find which bits are actually set in at least one of the numbers. And then we can take that, kind of what I drawn here, take this and then multiply it by two to the power of three minus one. Or you could also say left shift it by n minus 1, where n is a number of values that we had, which in this problem was 3, because these are the three numbers. Now, how exactly do we find these? Like, how do we know which bits are actually set? You could obviously just, you know, loop over each number. The easiest way, though, is just to logic or or bitwise or these numbers together, because we just want to know that it shows up in at least one of the numbers. So if we take every single input number, or it together, we will get this. And then this itself will be multiplied by two to the power of n minus one, or you could shift it to the left by n minus one. Obviously the time complexity of this is just gonna be big O of n as you'll see in a second. Okay, so all that work to code up a very simple solution actually. So we'll say this is our result so far. And the first phase is just gonna be going through every number and oring it together. So result is gonna be ORed with that number. So now we have all the bits that happen to be set. With those bits, we just want to say, multiply them by two to the power of length of nums minus one. I don't think I need these outer parentheses. And for what it's worth, this is equivalent to this shifted to the left by length of nums minus one. I think here we would probably need parentheses. I just think that this is slightly more confusing because I think multiplication kind of really does explain exactly what's going on. So I'll go ahead and run it. As you can see on the left, it works, and I guess it is a bit more efficient. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.